Hello, and welcome to Stumble Upon. I'm Austin. And I'm Emily. Today we're discussing Morvern Collar, directed by Lynn Ramsey. As always, there'll be plenty of fucking spoilers. But if that doesn't scare you, then strip naked, put on your favorite mixtape, and prepare to dismember your lover, because we are discussing empathy and hope. Austin, do you have a synopsis to read for us today? Yeah, uh, the synopsis for Morvern Collar reads as such. After her beloved boyfriend's suicide, a morning supermarket worker and her best friend hit the road in Scotland, but find that grief is something that you can't run away from forever. There are a couple things wrong with that. Mm-hmm. They, they, they go to Spain. Mm-hmm. They live in Scotland, but they go to Spain. So you're saying that's not a good synopsis. I'm saying that it uh, either omits or forgets really important details or or the person who wrote this believes possibly that Spain and Scotland look exactly the same. I mean, yeah. I would I would safely say that Spain and Scotland are interchangeable. Yes. There's zero difference between the two places. They La- even speak the same language. Yeah, language ex- <laughs> exactly. And they're located in the exact same part mm-hmm. of the world. And Scotland is known for its warmth. Well, they do both start with the letter S. And that's a problem of naming. We so should, I obviously, it's not should, their fault. Like, we should only have 26 uh, uh, countries because we have a different letter for each one. <laughs> Great ideas by Austin. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> okay, I have a review here that I thought would be fun to kind of pick through a little bit. Okay. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's extraordinarily long. But it is available online for anyone who wants to read the whole review of Morvern Collar. Now, where is it from? I will mention that. Okay. One of the mysteries of the early stages of Morvern Collar is Morvern's behavior after finding the body. She cries inwardly and privately, but such is her aura that we don't know if she's crying for him or for herself. He left money for a funeral, but after several days when she can ignore the body no longer... She cuts it up and throws it away. There is a close-up of the computer screen as she deletes his name on the title page of the novel and types in her own. Is she heartless, crazy, or what? I think the answer is right there in the film, but less visible to American viewers because we are less class conscious than the filmmakers. Morvern lives in her boyfriend's fairly expensive and comfortable Glasgow flat, but still works at the supermarket. If they were truly a couple with a future and had been together for some time, Isn't it reasonable to expect that she would no longer be holding on to that job? My guess is that their relationship began fairly recently, based on sex, between incompatibles, and fueled by a lot of drinking, and that by killing himself, he was, from her point of view, shown how unimportant she was to him, and how lightly he took their relationship and his life. When a younger person who is not dying or in unbearable crisis commits suicide, it is often an act of selfish, unforgivable egotism. So I'm going to leave Roger Ebert's review right there. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. the laughter. I found that atrocious, uh-huh. unacceptable, and just such old man white privilege views. It's it's interesting because I I, I will say that as someone who grew up uh, revering Ebert a lot in my in my adolescence and early twenties. Uh, he really was the one who enforced in, in me this idea that film is about empathy with people that we don't know and have never met. And to hear something so blatantly hypocritical to that theme mm-hmm. is really like, I mean, I have in my, in the years since then, kind of grown to understand and accept that most people who have any sort of position of power or position of uh, who have a soapbox to talk on. Generally, and this is obviously also a generalization, generally don't find nuance or can't find a way to articulate nuance in a way that is acceptable or understandable to the masses. Like you, like a review, as, as we kind of talked about in, in other episodes, is... An impossible thing to do because you're, as a reviewer, especially a reviewer on deadline, you have a specific amount of time in which you can talk about something Mm -hmm. and then print it out. Mm -hmm. And usually you're thinking about your first thoughts, whereas... Which is really true in this article when you read the whole thing because he gets the timeline all messed up. Mm -hmm. He's wrong about 
95% of the order it comes. He's not wrong about the events that happen. Mm -hmm. He's just incorrect in what order they come in and therefore have a completely different meaning. Yeah, to to quote uh, Alec Baldwin in that regards from uh, from (laughs) State and Maine, I know my lines, I just don't know what order they come in. Correct. Okay. So That is exactly what he's doing in this. So he gets it all mucked up and then it gives... It gives an intention behind the actions a really different meaning. Yeah. He says things like um, she sold the book and got all the money and so took her friend on holiday. Mm-hmm. Well, nope. Nope. Not at all. You missed the whole second half of the movie. Yeah. Like, one of the most one of the most interesting things about the film in particular, one of the things that I that I, I do absolutely want to talk about as much as as possible on this podcast is how important the details are in this film and that it is a film that is almost impossible to discern upon first viewing. Like, like he may be a little bit right in the sense that because it's Scottish and everybody speaks with a deep Scottish accent at times, it's almost impenetrable unless you have the subtitles on to watch it because you just don't know what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And, and then you're relying on subtitles, which even on the copy that we have, there are parts that uh, it says inaudible, and I can clearly understand what the words are. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, you know, there's an element of putting your trust in somebody else's understanding of what's being said, especially when it's not a director approved version of the film or release. Mm-hmm. Because the director or the writer or the cinematographer would know what that was fucking said mm-hmm. because they spent so much time with it mm-hmm. or, or the editor. The fucking, editor will yeah. know. I think that that attention to detail is something that like how Lynn Ramsey chooses to display and dole out the information of the film is one of the most magical parts of watching this film because you learn so much the more careful attention you pay. What would you say to that? I would say that this film is stunningly beautiful and quiet and poetic. Mm-hmm. I would say that Lynn Ramsey spent a lot of time crafting the story. Mm-hmm. And I would say that it is a very subjective film in that she is refusing to tell you what to think. Mm-hmm. Even though the camera is so focused on such small moments, mm-hmm. I think she's giving so much room for you to bring your own perspective at the table yeah and actually you bring up the fact that ebert initially taught you that films were a space of empathy Mm -hmm. i think that's what is so beautiful about this film is the amount of empathy that is brought to the table by this by this by the filmmaker by this story Mm -hmm. because of the way she's telling it is that morality is not what is it? Scorsese always says, like, in in a film, either God exists or doesn't exist, which is such a binary bullshit concept, but right. whatever. I, I think he says in my films. In his film. That's fine, then. It's yeah. your films. You can say whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but in, in this film, I would say it's so removed from the morality of society in mm-hmm. the fact that we're not judging, or we can judge if we choose to, but the film is not judging Morvern's actions. Yeah. Which, if you step back from it are crazy Mm -hmm. but when you think about it and you know her as we do with her being raised in foster care with her having no one all the things that happened to her all the things that she's been experiencing every action she takes feels so logical but not cold Mm -hmm. i feel it's her choice and being respectful Mm -hmm. it's her it's her truth it's sort of we were discussing earlier today how idiosyncratic we've probably all become because we've been in pandemic Mm -hmm. like we've not been interacting with people the way we used to we don't have as much accessibility our homes have become kind of forts our castles Uh, yes (laughs) we have always lived in the castle yeah um and our our castles have become our own unique idiosyncratic kind of worlds Mm -hmm. and because we don't have people coming in and out all the time you can allow yourself to kind of turn into yourself more right and become truer to yourself and so what i think what i feel like we have here is a perfect distillation of that with morvern collar this amazing exploration of what if we removed all that judgment and instead of her being punished for her behavior or 
you know, destroyed for her actions. What if this was just a world where this kind of was an option? How would we all feel about her? Right. I, I think that, like, to to touch on something you said earlier in that, something that I do love about cinema in general, especially cinema that's like this, that's kind of poetic, is that it allows your mind to just kind of touch base with different thoughts and attitudes that you have. And if you are open enough to just pursue those thoughts, the films can just kind of push you in a direction where you're either comfortable or not comfortable with the things that you're addressing or you think that the film is addressing, but that the film isn't judging you for having those thoughts. And in fact, if you like say the film is a murder mystery for some, for an example, and you start thinking that this person's the person who did it because of this action they did or that thing they did, but it turns out to be somebody completely different. Are you wrong for having those thoughts? Like, I think we're taught in some ways that we would be that, that you're wrong. Like, because there's discernible proof that somebody else did it. But in reality, the film is inspiring a thought. And that is an, that is a victory to be had because we should be checking in with the thoughts that we have about certain things, certain attitudes, certain places, certain people all the time. And a film like More From Caller is a film in which we are presented a character who is very, who does, ostensibly does a lot of things that you could say are very, very sketchy or outside of your norm oh well yeah chopping up a body yeah would definitely be considered outside my normal week yes and, and to 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 be to jump back and clarify that specifically her boyfriend commits suicide yes she then sees his suicide note then takes a bath and chooses to go out for drinks with her friend and get high taking uh, taking ecstasy and going to a party and staying up all night and then comes back and his body's still there. And she starts living her life. Like he leaves her Christmas presents. And she, before this, she mm -hmm. opens up her Christmas presents. So sweet. And like all these actions accumulate to almost feel like she is a horrible, heartless human being. And yet I feel like Samantha Morton's performance and the, the character of Morvern is so empathetic. Mm -hmm. And that... I think that I think the last moment of the film, which is covered by the song dedicated to the one I love, is a suggestion of how uh, Lynn Ramsey feels about Morvern. I think that the whole film is dedicated to her and to people who find themselves in extraordinary positions that are impossible to to answer with what is the binary narrative of most of, of most christian societies mm -hmm. i think that when morvern chops up his body and and takes it to a field and buries it which by the way is a common motif in lynn ramsey's films like she, like like she, joaquin phoenix's character in you were never really here does the same thing with a body with his mother's body in uh in a lake hmm. uh it's it's almost like she wants to bring the tactile element of you will bury your loved one. Yeah. Physically, you will carry this and, person, which is going to make me cry. Yeah, and it's and it's I feel like what Morvern does specifically is when you watch the scene of her burying her her boyfriend, you could look at her like she dances around, she runs with her arms open in the wind, and you could look at it very very callously, but I almost feel like it's her honoring his, yeah, his, I agree with his, you. his his life and their life together. I think that, and this might be my empathy running amok, but I, I do think that she's honoring him and honoring the memory of what they had. I think that it's really easy to see somebody do something that is different from how we would handle it and immediately go to judge them mm -hmm. and say that they are doing it wrong and we are doing it right. And because of that, we have the answer and they have insanity. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that like it doesn't get far from like folk horror, the the honoring of this body, this person, taking it to the ground, burying it. And you could say, yeah, well, she chopped the fucker up. <laughs> How the fuck is that honoring it? Well, yeah, 
He did, he also kills himself in her apartment and leave, in the apartment they share and leaves a fucking note on a computer. Yeah, he leaves her to pick up all the pieces on his own, on her own. Yeah. Knowing her lack of resources. Right. Now he does leave her the money. Mm -hmm. Um, And first off, I want to say, like, the thing that I hate most about Ebert's review was his callous dismissal of suicide. If if somehow you're young and you commit suicide, Mm -hmm. you're an egotist. So I just want to say out there, go fuck yourself, Ebert. Go fuck yourself for thinking that and saying it. You mentioned the folk horror element of physically burying the body, of her being respectful to her boyfriend, who is referenced as him in the whole movie, other than you saw his name on the screen for mm-hmm. the book. But otherwise, nobody ever says his name. We don't yeah. know his, we know his name is James, but we don't know his name is James, which is really interesting. So this review pisses me off so much because it is so dismissive of so many elements that are just, as you said, different than the societal norms. Mm-hmm. She is honoring him in a way, I think profoundly honoring him by taking him someplace beautiful. She had to go pretty far, carry him on her back, herself really far and with a tiny little shovel dig a grave and i thought was incredibly honoring in her way she talked in earlier she talks to her best friend about how her foster mom is buried on the island over there across the lake and so you get the sense that maybe this is how she learned how to respect the dead and bring them to someplace beautiful Mm -hmm. and so she's also staring at at his bank account thinking about his funeral and he has 3,000 pounds in there, which is a, or almost 4,000 pounds, which is a fuck ton of money when you're working as a, as a shitty grocery clerk Mm -hmm. with no future ahead of you and no support system. Yeah. And I could see her being an incredibly practical person going what she doesn't even know. I'm if she'd already researched, we have no idea if she's already researched how much it costs to bury a person, a fuck ton, by the way, if anybody's wondering, well, if she's uh, already buried her foster mom, she, she at might least, already know. She might already know. This is exact. Okay, good point. Yeah, and and those are the type of details that are really fascinating upon upon watching the film multiple times. It's mm-hmm. just layered in. Yes, exactly. She may be paying off the debt of that burial mm-hmm. right now. We don't know. Yeah, and I love that Lynn Ramsey doesn't tell you every fucking detail. She just puts in those little pieces it's in a lot of ways like there's a really wonderful essay about lynn ramsey on youtube by tony Zhao and taylor ramos and one of the things that they talk about is they they have in the essay is lynn ramsey talking about robert brisson and brisson was famous for believing that the actors are models and shouldn't do a lot and should just do the action and then the audience will impose their feelings upon the person and that will be a greater experience for the audience than just if they are told through the emotional output what they feel. And I think that in some ways this film is an incredible mirror in that regards. It allows you to look at something, look at yourself a lot of times and if you spend a lot of time with this film and watch it over and over again, like like we have in our in our life, it's a film that I come back to probably once a year and watch. And that might say a lot about me, but I don't really fucking care. But like, it's a film that holds the mirror up and allows us to go, okay, so why do I disagree with this? Why am I judging this person? When they are obviously in pain, when they are obviously somebody who has empathy and humanity within them and flowing through every part of them why why am i judging this portion why am i judging this element that they're choosing what is going on what is it about me that says that this is wrong this is her uh i would say or rather would you agree that lynn ramsey likes to put the audience into a position of questioning their own moral compass yeah I, let's talk about kevin yeah let's talk about uh, we need to talk about kevin mm. uh uh, you were never really here. Like her first film, Rat Catcher. It's either Rat Catcher or one of her short films that co-stars her sister or daughter. I'm not exactly sure, but half-ass internet research. But she's like, and the girl is really young and put into uh, sexual situations. Mm. And there's there's an element of like there's an element of sexuality as a subject not an object uh to quote an essay i recently read uh 
that sexuality is a subject. And it's not an object. It's not something that we just look at and ogle at. It's a subject which we should mine and communicate with and, and talk about because it's a really fucking hard conversation. And it, like thinking about all the sexual situations in in Morvern that could be perceived as sexual, like the way that we in the West in our puritanical manner uh, uh, view it, like the scenes with the Morvern and her best friend in the bathtub together nude, that there's an element of people who'd be like, oh my God, there are two women naked in a bathtub. I wonder what's going to happen. You're like, they're taking a bath, motherfucker. They're, Same with Desert Hearts. Yeah, they're taking a bath. Like there isn't, there isn't sexuality to here to this moment necessarily. That's saying more about you and how you view things than what the film is saying about itself. It's asking, it's asking a question. You're answering it very specifically. Mm-hmm. And hey, like even the sex scene in in Morvern with Morvern and possibly her dead uh, dead partner. Or possibly somebody that she met, that she just meets on her vacay in Spain. Like, yeah, I think it's her, her dead partner. I think it is too. But it's never like like a lot of things in this film. It's necessarily unanswered. Mm-hmm. And so, like, even that scene where they're laughing and crying, but it starts with him saying, "My mom just died," mm-hmm. and her saying. Uh, I can tell you about my mom's funeral. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the scene plays out and it ends with them fucking and her crying and laughing and all sorts of emotions. And all all those sorts of emotions are so fucking earned by that point of the mm-hmm. film. And that scene, like that scene in specific is just straight up incredible because of what it is. Like, I don't know what to make of what she's envisioning. And I don't really care that I don't. I really just appreciate the fact that she's, that, that, that we get to see it, that it's incredibly honest and human and beautiful. Grief is confusing and fractured. And I feel like that's what Lynn Ramsey was doing in the scene with the maybe ghost boyfriend Mm -hmm. is exploring the fractured feelings of grief, her goodbye to him, whether it's actually him or just somebody else, but I'm, I feel fairly certain it's him. Yeah. Um, but her goodbye, her last moments, all that emotion that's tied in. Yeah. It's such a great representation of grief. Yeah, and it comes at probably the point of the film where it's the end of the second act and we're end, we're entering in the last portion of the story that we're going to tell about her. And if we take it that it is her boyfriend, then it is her goodbye to that portion of her life. And the mm-hmm. rest of the things, the rest of the choices that she makes, dragging her friend along to the desert to look for more adventures, getting a book deal for the book that he wrote that she's taking credit for, mm-hmm. and then returning to Scotland to ask her friend to come with her one more time, but her friend doesn't want to go. Mm-hmm. Like all of those elements are now her moving forward with her life instead of treading water. Mm-hmm. Well, she realizes at the at the they go to the big fancy resort yeah. with the expectation of having a really great time, and you see her slowly pull away and pull away and pull away, and her friend is having a blast, mm-hmm. and none of this is working for Morvern which actually fully supports my hatred of Ebert's review. Mm -hmm. He's so dismissive of Morvern Mm -hmm. as if she's just this piece of shit, but he's this brilliant writer and, you know, he's just fucking her recently. Mm -hmm. And yet that isn't supported at all by the film. Right. The film is, I wrote this for you. This book was written for you. Mm -hmm. And what I love about Morvern is there's a certain element of her that is very literal Mm -hmm. as if she's almost just marginally on the spectrum and she sees you wrote it for me. Great. I guess then it's my book now. Yeah. So I should put my name on it and send it off. And this is how I'm supposed to send it off. So I'm going to do that. And and then this money is going to provide for me so that I don't have to work at this supermarket anymore and I can change my life. Mm-hmm. And all, all of that. I think, it, I think that her pairing with him was not because she was some fuck buddy, but rather because they were actually connected. Yeah. Which is why she's so fucking alone now. It's not like she blends with anybody in town. Nobody else gets her. Mm-hmm. Um, she clearly had a, 
a deep, profound love for this guy. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me how isolated she is. And so she goes off and finds her, her world. Uh-huh. She's a total badass. She's a total badass. And I would also argue, I would also say that all the things that are said in that review that are meant as derogatory towards Morvern don't have to be. Like, so what if they just started dating? So what? Like, mm. what does it actually fucking matter? Like, what is it? Why is any of those fucking things important? Also, like, why would she not have a job just because she's dating somebody? You, yeah. Sexist piece of shit. Right. But like, the point is, is for me, the point is, what the fuck does it matter? Everything that Ebert says in that review is a really good reflection of his state of mind and not really a reflection of Morvern in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I was talking to you about this film a little while ago, and I was saying how I think that in a lot of ways this is a really interesting feminist piece because almost everything she does once the film starts is antithetical to how we in this kind of patriarchal society think that people should act mm. like that every like she almost does like we find out through through the course of the film that Morvern doesn't have a phone in her house so the first thing she does after she's found the body and after she's read the note is she goes to the goes to a train station to call the cops but she or call somebody we don't know who she's going to call because she never ends up calling. She puts the the receiver down before she dials any number. In that moment, in rejecting to alert the authorities and it, and rejecting to take the normal steps, the accepted steps towards what you do next, she in some ways is rejecting and the film is rejecting a normal narrative of how somebody deals with grief mm -hmm. and then the film does the amazing thing which is we now will deal with her grief mm -hmm. we're now actually going to deal with it we're gonna it's sit in it we're gonna sit in it and it even starts from the very beginning the first shot of the film is her head in close-up and you can see his ear as she lays on him and takes in his warmth for one last time his 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 scent for one last time as he dies, as he's dead on the ground, like laying there halfway into, into their living room next to their Christmas tree that they, they got with his presents that he bought her that are wrapped, that he took time and care to wrap individually and a note that he took time to leave her and a blood trail that leads from the kitchen where he obviously slit his wrists to the, the living room where he fell and died. Like we learn all of this information, not through her saying anything, but through visual cues and context. And because of that, the film sets up this narrative of learning everything that you're going to do, everything that you're going to learn through visual context cues. And if, if most of American cinema at that point, which is 2002, and beyond has become uh, exposition. This film rejects all of those sorts of norms and says, we can tell a story that is captivating, that is humane, and that is incredibly action-packed, if not action in, t in what we typically attribute to action as in violence and fighting, but action is in actions without words. It's an incredible statement of purpose. Oh, fuck, that made me sad. Just describing it all made me so sad. Whew. It's such a terribly sad film. It's a heavy film. And yet, like, I do feel constantly like Morvern is an aspirational character for me. Like, I, I again, like, take of that what you will about me. But I think Morvern and her willingness to push forward and to deal with what is happening because i do not think that she's like she's sheltering herself or or lying to herself about what happened i think she's just trying to find her place like even what she says to her friend she says he's gone mm -hmm. and her friend's like oh he'll come back she's like no he's gone he's gone to another country 
And yesterday you brought up that you heard that line. It made you think of Hamlet, Mm -hmm. to be or not to be, and the idea of going to another country. The undiscovered country. Mm -hmm. From his from his great monologue Mm -hmm. which is such an interesting idea if this what if as you said what if this film is saying let's explore just this monologue Mm -hmm. from Morvern's perspective of okay well do I continue Mm -hmm. because he has chosen to not be so do I go to be or do I choose not to be and Mm -hmm. what will that path look like right it's such a thought experiment. The whole film mm-hmm. is an is just a giant thought experiment. And I think that, like, I think that through the course of the film, she chooses to be mm. very actively. And I think that that's what, like, I think again, we could look at that wonderful scene between her and uh, her ghost, ghost boyfriend and think that's when she chooses to be. Mm, I say she chooses to be way earlier than that. I think she chooses to be when she looks at the bank account and she says, "Why am I going to spend?" Thirty eight hundred dollars, thirty eight hundred pounds on, mm-hmm. on a burial when I can do a better job and right. I can give him a better burial and then I'm gonna live with that money. I've never had access to this before. Let's yeah. let me go celebrate him, because she does go see him ultimately. You think if you think about it, her trip to the resort, yeah, takes her to to physically see him. We don't know. Maybe they had gone there. In a previous time, maybe that was a previous... Yeah, maybe that's the place that they went and they had that conversation before. And that's Mm -hmm. the reason why she thought of going to that resort. Because maybe like that pink dress she's wearing is the only dress she takes out of her backpack or out of her suitcase when she leaves her friend, when Mm -hmm. she leaves her with all of her stuff. She's like, okay, you can have my case. This is the one... Yeah, when they get into a fight after after no. Morvern takes her friend to uh, a, a a village that's having a party that her <gasps> friend just is having a bad time in because she just dropped to ecstasy that morning and yeah. is coming down and really upset with Morvern and then they have to walk back and she's just pissed. And at the end of that, at the end of the night, Morvern leaves her and takes that dress that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's the only thing she took. So yeah. it also could have been a previous visit. Mm-hmm. It could have been a continuous celebration of him. Yeah. So I say she chooses to be every single action she takes as a choice yeah. is maybe a crossroads. Mm-hmm. So if every crossroad, her choice kept turning to be. Yeah. And I think you might be right. Like I might've been putting too much pressure on that scene. Like hearing you say that, I think that you could say that every action she chooses is an action of to be, to be active in her own life. Like she's choosing... She's choosing not to become a, a victim of his suicide mm-hmm. uh, by having somebody come there and then people you know, finding the, the even if she's not thinking this, people coming and finding the, the manuscript and then it becoming his great novel and she never sees a dime of it. Right. And while that could be very callously placed on her, I don't necessarily thinking think that she's thinking that. She's just like, she's choosing... I'm going to make my choice. I'm mm-hmm. going to make this. I'm going to be this. I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to go to this party tonight and try to get lost for a little bit. I'm going to flash this uh, this ferryman on the river uh, while while he's in his boat. I'm going to do these things. I'm I'm going to try to test out the limits of what it means to be me as a human being. Boundary pushing. Yeah. And I think that maybe if, if I do go back to that scene with a, a dead ghost boy, uh, the moment that she she chooses to stop living in reflection to him, mm-hmm. but in true action for herself is that. Mm-hmm. Like all the other choices are kind of reflections of the things that he, like of the grief that she's do, she's living with. And then she chooses to go on an adventure for herself. It might even be, reflections of him reflections of everyone so her best friend all the people she loves Mm -hmm. remember she goes to visit her best friend's grandmom yep after when she's sort of alone and and doesn't know what to do with herself she comes up with the idea to go on the resort takes the best friend i've got everything i've got you covered don't worry about money yeah and she's there and she's not happy she tries to bring her friend with her to try something different Mm -hmm. and her friend rejects it and so she's like okay i see that you're unhappy but i need to go so you're right i think that moment when she she leaves her friend her case and is just like, I'm out mm-hmm. and goes on her adventure. I I love that. I love that 
she goes off and she is successful. Yeah. And then her friend finds her way back. It's clear her friend was fine. Well, and even she checks she calls in. in. She checks in with the resort to find out if her friend has shown back up. And, yeah. And the resort tells her that she has. And she's like, she doesn't need to search for her anymore. Like, she, she makes sure that her friend stayed sexy and didn't get murdered. <laughs> like, Always ideal. Yeah. So she, like, she does a whole bunch of, uh, she, she's, even if you view Morvern as an unlikable character, she does so many things throughout the film that are kind to the people around her. Absolutely. That it, it muddles the water. It makes it so murky. Like it makes her more human because we all do shit that we realize that isn't ideal in the moment and maybe wouldn't play well to a test audience, but it's true to us and we're trying to be like there's no fucking map to our life there isn't a legend there are people who have authorities who say authority that they have created for themselves that say this is the way things are and this is the way it should be and this is how you should do it but just like grief life is unexpected and we don't get to determine it and tell somebody that they're really doing it wrong unless they're an autocratic dictator who is a fucking asshole stand with the Ukraine. So I find that I think Lynn Ramsey tipped the hat that she, that Morvern was an incredibly empathetic character by that very first scene you said, you described when she goes to the train station to call the authorities or someone yeah. to call someone and doesn't, but then is still sitting there contemplating what she should or shouldn't do. And then instead chooses to Answer the phone. Yeah, and a phone call comes. And she, the phone call, yeah, the un, the phone of the stranger calls, and she takes the moment to chat with the stranger and then comfort the stranger mm-hmm. and say, I'm sure she'll be okay. Yeah. I'm sure she'll be fine. And it was such a sweet moment. She's so kind and sweet in her attention to the stranger mm-hmm. as she herself is so confused and lost and doesn't know what to do. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, is in <laughs> hey kitten. She's in shock. Mm-hmm. Um, I really think that first scene is her in shock. Like I don't know what to do, and that's why she goes out. Yeah. Um, Ebert is so dismissive of her going out to party, but I think it's more of I. I have this. You know what it makes me think of when the big earthquake hit in Seattle, mm-hmm. and um, I was on my way to a job interview, and. The whole world was shaking around me and I was hiding in a building that was swaying and the lampposts were touching the ground and the earth was rolling like Godzilla was walking around the corner. And then when it stopped and we were all okay, all the people around me, I just continued on to my job interview, even though I had to walk up 17 flights of stairs because the elevators were down. Like it didn't occur to me to stop and go find you. Mm -hmm. You spent two hours trying to find me and freaking out that something was wrong with me. But I was like, well, I have this job interview. I have to go. So I'm going to go to it. Yeah. And you're when you're young, your brain works that way. You don't, you're just, you just don't kind of conceptualize that. No, there was a big earthquake. Your job interview is fine. It'll still be there. They're mostly out of the building anyway. They didn't know what to do with me when I arrived. And it just, it, it blows the mind how, how much a younger person's mind operates in that. But this is the task that I was set out to do. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. And also it speaks to it speaks to how we respond in moments of stress. Like she doesn't know what to do. So she picks a lane, which is I'm in pain. I know my friend is going to do this for me. So let's go have a good time. I've already planned it. I'm supposed to meet her at seven o'clock. I'm going to I'm 10 minutes late. I'll just go. Yeah. And 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 coldly or callously, I could say. It's not like James is going to be upset by it. Right. He's still going to be there. Yeah, still, She's got that super practical mindset of like, yeah. well, he'll still be here. So I'll deal with this when I get back. Yeah. The, and, and her practical mindset is incredible throughout the film. Like when she's like when she when she says to her friend, he's gone. He's gone to an un, uh, uh, he's gone to a different country. He's it, like she later says he's dead to him. And like all of these things just get tossed off by her friend because she's just not aware and i think that or 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 present enough with with morvern or without the uh 
without the freedom from her own trauma to be able to deal with somebody else's. Mm. Uh, mm, that's a good point. Like, Everybody's so mired in their own shit. Yeah. They can't step back and go, wait a minute. What did you say? Yeah. It's like you were talking about earlier today, this podcast that you were listening to in which they, there was a true crime podcast about this person who is this terrible motherfucker and what terrible motherfucking things he did to, to his family and how, and they were bemoaning how the fact how how the fuck did the neighbors not know? And this was a, the family that this terrible thing happened to were, were a group of transients. And like, how dare uh, we know or we allow ourselves to blame people for not knowing some things about people that they don't know at all <laughs> by going... So judgy. Yeah, it's like we all... It is really fortunate I will say this, and maybe this is a clearer way to say it. It is really fortunate and lucky when you are in a community of people who are aware and present enough with you to notice when something is going wrong for you Mm -hmm. and that you're in trouble and that they have the wherewithal and ability themselves to look at that pain and trouble that you're in and offer up their sincere condolences to you and actual support yeah to be useful it so is, rare it is so rare like we we act like that should be the norm and maybe it should but the way that we actually kind of exist in this world the way that i have seen it at least is that we're all mired in our own shit and 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 we are we put limitations all over the place for allowing shit in. Well, and also the idea that that would be a utopian experience mm-hmm. is is exactly that. It's a utopian concept mm-hmm. that we're all able to pay attention and help every other person. Yeah. When we don't have a society built that way, we don't have universal health care. We don't have universal base income. We're not having a living wage for minimum wage. Mm-hmm. We're not taking care of our people. We're now apparently thinking it's fine to attack parents who have trans kids. Yeah. You know, so the idea that we can all be on each other's backs means that we're all coming from the same place. Yeah. And none of us are coming from the same place. Yeah. It, something that I constantly say uh, in, in or believe in, in, in the films that we make is that, that empathy gets you killed. Mm-hmm. And it's unfortunate that that is a reality because empathy does like mm-hmm. in real life, like when you, when you put too much empathy out to other people, they take advantage of it and they, they punish you for it. Mm-hmm. It's one of the reasons why I'm drawn to horror films a lot of, a lot of times because they are morality tales about how empathy gets you fucking killed. Yep. Like when somebody calls out in the night uh, and there's a killer out in the night and they're like, Marcy, is that you? And we all in the audience go, it's not fucking Marcy, you fucking moron. They're going to fucking kill you. <laughs> and we're we're judging that person for their empathy. Mm. And we're punishing, and we're like, of course they're going to fucking get killed. They're looking out for this person. You're like, wait a minute. They're looking out for a human being. Right. Like, isn't that fucking tragic that we're now looking at them going, they should be fucking killed because of it, or mm-hmm. they deserve this fucking death that they're going to get? Like, empathy... Empathy should be treasured, and it is not. And valued. Yeah. It is a precious commodity. Uh, it, it is overly smashed and destroyed and used up. And abused. Like, abused it, is a good it, it, It's it. abused in social media, in all the posts that, mm. that, that, that fit through, uh, uh, get into your, into your feed saying, this is the way, like, this is where you sh- your empathy should be. This is where your empathy should be. This is how you should do it. And it's just fucking vultures a lot or, of times. Or rather... It is you have no right to have empathy for that. You mm-hmm. must have em- empathy for my thing. Yeah. Only. Yeah. It gets it gets very controlly. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And and to tie that to Morvern, I think, like unless you had a better tie, um, Morvern isn't actually asking for our empathy in any case. She isn't asking from anybody their empathy. She doesn't ask anybody at all Mm-mm. to be sad for her. She doesn't ask shit from anybody throughout. She asks for people to join her on vacations, to be present with her, to uh, to be there. And she's just moving through her life without the semblance of an idea that there could be empathy for her by someone else. And not that she's walking through life going, there's no nobody else would have empathy for me. What was me? Mm-hmm. But... Rather that that has probably never been offered to her beyond maybe her boyfriend. Right. And so she's just 
doing her shit. She's handling her shit in a very different way. It's an incredible thought experiment. Yeah. It, it's also, in, in that terminology, it's also incredible to think. One of her boyfriend's lines to her was, this seemed like the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And you can look at that and think of it as very, like, in a very dismissive way. But you could also look at that and say, and I think that it's worth at least exploring if, like, in, in, in my mind it's worth exploring, the idea that maybe that's something that means the world to her. Maybe she understands that. Mm-hmm. This seems like, it seemed like the right thing to do. Like, and so she does that for herself. Right. And, like, it seemed like the right thing to do, like, to end it, to, to, to cast in with uh, no more dreams. Like, it seemed like the right thing to do. And she's, she does, as you just said, does that with everything. It seemed like go on vacation. It seemed like the right thing to do. Go back to Spain or go on a different trip. It seems like the right thing to do. T- put my name on the top of the manuscript and not have to work 26 years or 36 years, whatever number she gives at this. 39 sh- years to, to get a pension. At a pension, yeah. In like, that shitty grocery store. Yep. Yeah. Like, it seemed like the right thing to do. And while I like, I'm not trying to suggest like I condone any of your behavior. No, we're or, not saying go chop up your dead boyfriend. Right, but it's it is such a worthy thought experiment. Mm-hmm. Isn't that the point of art? Yeah, we're not condoning any behaviors. We are just exploring what if if you put it if you put a character into this position, what happens? And I just think that's the point of art. It's to mm-hmm. explore ideas mm-hmm. and to have you explore the ideas as an audience member and think it through and ask questions. As you said earlier, don't just accept everything at face value because societal norms have made it so. Yeah. How else are we going to make change and evolve? Yeah. And why not put ourselves all in a really uncomfortable position of watching this young girl all by herself chop up her dead boyfriend's body yeah. and burn pizza? At the same time. Yep. One of the things I also really, really love about the film is the cinematography. Yeah. It's so beautiful. It's intimate and fluid. It's close up without being uh, shaky handheld. Like, even though I think that a lot of it is handheld. I do too, but it's not that annoying born identity, like epilepsy while filming this type of thing. Yeah. It, there's so much time spent looking at more of her and look at things and... And again, this is a quality of of both Lynn Ramsey and Samantha Morton and the cinematographer and the editor and everybody involved. Finding a way to be captivating while just watching somebody look. It's unbelievable. Yeah. What it is to me is it has um, notes of Francis Bacon mm. and Caravaggio. Yeah. You can just see some of the renaissance paintings Mm -hmm. reflect it in this the choice of shots in the lighting Mm -hmm. a lot of it is there's a bunch of it at night yeah i just really love the exploration of frame setup Mm -hmm. so when we shot citywide our movie coming out soon you might have heard us mention it before and if you haven't check out the link in our show notes to watch the trailer but when we shot citywide i was watching a lot of hong sang soo director from Korea whose work I love and you love. And his work is very much a plop the camera down in one spot and let the whole scene play out in front of you. It's a very simplistic type of filmmaking of, of shot setup. And it really works for his stories. It really, really works. And so a lot of that was very influential for me in terms of us shooting citywide because it was such a big film with 17 characters Mm -hmm. and so many people, so many bodies to be moving around set. And we come from a theatrical background. And so a lot of the shots were done very theatrically, a lot of oneers um, on purpose because the, for you, the influence of Spielberg Mm -hmm. of, I would actually, uh, uh, Spielberg is an influence, but I would say like Kurosawa and a lot of the Japanese filmmakers of his era Mm -hmm. are more influential to me. Like Spielberg is, Spielberg's the way to Spielberg's crown is not something that I would like to take up, especially his more schmaltzy stuff. Oh, I agree with that. But he does do a good winner. Yes, he does. So we have a lot of influence with that, with especially Hung Sang Su and the way we shot. But watching Morvern Collar 
this time it just was like okay yeah this is what i want to do for our next film yeah i want to play with that shot okay the, my favorite shot in the whole film is when the girls are going up the stairs with the suitcase because they're moving in her best friend. Yeah. And they drop the, the suitcase and it goes back down the stairs and they're giggling. But just the whole shot is from above as if we're a neighbor watching them move in. Yeah. And I love that shot. It's so funny. Mm-hmm. And just the creative ways that Lynn Ramsey gets her camera into places yeah. uh, allows us to know this is a film only. It can only be done as a film. Yeah. My, my favorite shot is the last shot of the film the actual last shot of the film and it's Mm. like it's it's a repetition like it's the only shot out of the repetition of the dance club because there's two shots of the same dance club with different music playing one is aggressive when she is not looking forward to being there anymore and Mm -hmm. one is 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 the dedicated to the one i love and the last shot of the of the film is a shot from a different angle of her throwing her head back into the side it's the camera seems to be over her shoulder uh perched higher up like three quarters and she turns with her mouth open and it's just like maybe a maybe like a 10 frame long shot from black to from black to black like there's Mm. a little bit of uh, of her face in between and it's just she looks like she's happy and it's one of the few times that she looks like that. And it's just a brief shot. Like mm-hmm. it's, but it's, it's so peculiar because I don't feel like we've ever been in that location with her Mm-mm. in the film up to that point. No, I love that shot too. You're right. She does seem happy. Mm-hmm. She's got her earbuds in. Yep. And, and she's just like, she's listening to the music that he left her. Like he, like James makes her a mixtape. Of all the songs and that fucking album, that fucking album sounds great, but it's like, it's just a, it's just a song that mm-hmm. she's jamming out to of his, of his choosing while she's on her adventure. I love that. Uh, the whole score is the mixtape. Yeah. Or, so it's implied. Yeah. No, the whole score is, is, is his mixtape that he made to her. Yeah. I also love that all the gifts he gave her were a hug. Is the big jacket, yeah, and the mixed the music to listen to, yeah, and the fire, yeah, to keep her warm, mm-hmm. and I just think that's such a an amazing collection of gifts. Yeah, it's to warm her heart and her to to warm her spirit. Mm-hmm. Yes, and so proof yet again that this was a a relationship that understood each other. Yeah, like he might not have been able to go on for his own reasons, but he didn't want her to follow that path. No, he gave her all the resources. He gave her his life, his record collection, which is what multiple people comment on yeah. about his, oh, he left his record collection, like when they think that he's just left her. Right. And and I couldn't believe that he would leave all the music. Yeah. And that's the one thing she comes back for. Yep. She comes back and grabs her suitcase and fills it with his music. Yep. And then leaves town. Yep. After checking in with her friend, trying to get her to come with her. Yeah. Oh, there's so many. Do you have another scene that's your favorite or another scene that you loved? I love their bathtub scene together after they come back from the party and uh, they stop at her friend's uh, grandmother's house. I love the grandma. Uh, and the grandma tells them to take a bath and they're in the bath together. And I just love how the information is doled out in that scene that Morvern finally tells her friend that that uh, he's gone. Mm-hmm. And... And she's like, oh, he'll come back. Like, she has just nothing but platitudes. But at the very end of the platitudes, uh, she's, her friend says, is it because of me? And it doesn't really register on Morvern what she says because Morvern is still in shock and thinking about all the terrible things that have gone on. Mm-hmm. And then her friend gets out of the bath and is like, uh, basically, you need to rest. You look tired. But we find out later that... Uh, her friend had a one night shag with uh, with Morvern's boyfriend, and that her friend feels incredibly guilty about it. Something that I'm not actually sure how I think Morvern feels about this information. I think she's sad. I think and, she's heartbroken, but, but she I, moves on. Yeah, but I think that it's like, oh, that's just another thing. Like, like, what am I going to do? Be mad at him because he's dead? Like, 
I could be mad at you, but whatever. Like, you're my friend. Like, yeah. I, there's a practicality to how she, like, she grieves for a minute, like, in a beautiful shot with uh, the rain falling on a window pane that's in front of her. Uh, but, like, I also am like, I don't know if if there's anything, if she's actually really mad at her friend at all during that time. No, I don't think so. Maybe she knew, maybe she had an inkling. And I think she was surprised. Yeah, but I love, like, I love that scene in the bathtub. Because it's incredibly intimate. Mm -hmm. It seems really lived in. Like it, it offers a whole bunch of questions about what kind of friendship or relationship does Morvern and her friend have. Mm -hmm. Like it's really a tight bond that they have to be able to do that as grown women in a bath together to just sit there and chat and 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 hang out and not like there's no judgment between the two there's no comments or anything like it's obviously not the first time they've done it like it might mm -hmm. be it might be something in which they know that there isn't a whole bunch of hot water in the house mm -hmm. so you have to bathe together to be able to get it through it might like it might be a class thing that they're dealing with but it doesn't really fucking matter because the scene is just so lovely and intimate it's not unlike desert hearts yeah same same concept two best friends sitting in the bathtub, it, it feels like we don't have a hot tub, we don't have a pool, so this is our way of being glamorous. Yeah. And I, I love it. I love it. Both both times, both movies. This is the month of babes and tubs who are just friends. Babes and tubs. <laughs> friends and tubs. Friends and tubs. And, February, friends and tubs month and, on the podcast. There are two more things that I want to uh, mention. Like, I think there's a way to look at this film and just watch it in – how is it being framed? Mm -hmm. As in, not with the camera, but within the camera frame itself. So doorways, how many doorways have different stories? Like the doorways of her and James's apartment. Mm -hmm. the, the doorways into the bathroom where she cho chops up the body. Mm -hmm. I also think there's a way to look at the film on how many drugs... Morvern does at the beginning of the film and where she is in a relationship with hard drugs at the end of the film hmm. because by the time they get to the big the party in Spain it doesn't f seem like she's taking ecstasy with her friend anymore mm -mm. like she's like there are again and what I mean by that not is that oh as a moralist oh she's stopping taking drugs I think that it's this is a change that's happening and these are the ways that Lynn Ramsey has chosen to show that change happen for Morvern. Her evolution. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what I, that's what I mean when I say the, the, her alteration with her drug, drug use. Like mm -hmm. there's a way to watch the film and see her change, not through her saying I'm changing or having a big tantrum scene or, or like a intervention. A, yeah. Or, or even like a, a, a typical Oscar scene where mm. she says something and she means it and everybody knows that that's how she's selling for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Like, like there's just, she just, she just starts changing because that's how changes happen. They happen incrementally mm -hmm. where people, who aren't paying attention don't notice. Almost imperceptibly. And then you're somebody new. It's like shedding your dead skin cells. All of a sudden, you're someone new. Or you just chop off your finger. Yeah. Well, Emily knows all about that. Ta-da! Three thumbs. <laughs> Whoops. I think my favorite scene... I don't know if I can say I have an absolute favorite scene. There's so many good ones in this movie. But one of my favorite scenes is her burial of her boyfriend is being out in nature of her picking someplace so beautiful of carrying him that whole way herself. And then the time she spends after in that space and seeing the buds sprouting on the trees and the bugs in the earth digging around the beetles and the worms mm -hmm. and everything. And how life it, is continuing. Yes. This idea of the cycle of life, but, also, we mentioned earlier folk horror, the idea of returning to the earth, mm -hmm. of actually physically being part of it. She's putting him into the earth. She's yeah. not using a big gigantic digger to dig it out. Mm -hmm. not, there's not a company that's been hired to do it, to remove all of the experience of death. Yeah, It's a very physical manifestation. Well, it's not even a physical manifestation. It's a very physical act 
that is a direct, indirect contact with both death and life. And I think it's really stunning. Yeah. In it in her exploration. I mean fucking Lynn Ramsey destroys it. It's so good. She's so good at it. Yeah. She's so good. I think the second thing that I want to say is that what you mentioned before with every frame of painting with Tony Zhao and Taylor Ramos and their discussion of Lynn Ramsey. She said in the video that when there's a lot of stuff happening on screen, bring out the sound. Mm-hmm. And when there's when the when the picture is, is minimal, bring sound back in. Mm-hmm. Don't compete. Mm-hmm. Don't have both things happening at the same time. And she knocks it out of the park in this film. Yeah. There's so many moments of quiet. And that's why it feels so poetic to me. This you have so much time to reflect as you watch this film and bring your own ideas to the table. And too often in cinema today, I find filmmakers are force feeding you a perspective and you don't get a chance to just sit in it and kind of be yourself within it or yeah. come to the table with your own ideas and just sort of explore it. Yeah. Lynn Ramsey's like, oh, you better come to the table with all your ideas because I'm going to give you so few of them. Yeah. It's, it, it which ma- I love. It makes me it makes me think that that poetry or art is like true versions of this is the piece of art or poetry or whatever film and us and the art is actually the space between those two where the interaction takes place. Mm -hmm. It isn't like poetry on a page is just words on a page. And then when somebody reads it and gives it meaning, it isn't them who's giving it meaning. It's the words in the space between the between the page and the person that the that the art actually takes place. The alchemy where thoughts exist, which is outside of us, which they just drop in. They they wander through the night sky and just kind of enter our brain. And that's that's thoughts, and that's what art is. That moment outside of us when something spurs that, and we can't we can't always contain it, but it just exists there in front of us. For us to to interact with, but not control. I love that. Emily, is there uh, any film or piece of art that you would like to mention to stumble upon? There are so many films and pieces of art that I would like to recommend to stumble upon next. I don't know where to begin. Well, I got one if you if you want a second to think about it. Yeah, Austin, what would you recommend to stumble upon next? I've been thinking a little bit about a film called Tampopo. <laughs> which is a wonderful, weird, beautiful uh, film. Uh, it's a Japanese film. It's about a woman who tries to start her own ramen shop. It's uh, a food, sex, comedy with a whole bunch of Western stylings. Uh, it's an incredible, absurdist thing that gives me a lot of comfort in times that I feel unsettled by the world and where we are right now i feel very unsettled so watching a film that accepts the absurdity of life and says that it can be fun and can be a little bit joyous is something that something that i look to in this moment to just kind of exist within and remember my own sort of humanity i love that recommendation tempo was amazing it's so weird. The egg so, sex scene. The is, eggs are very weird. It it it, it makes it makes me uncomfortable. It's it, unsettling. It gives me the feeling that you get when uh, you think of ASMR. Oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> giving everybody ASMR right there. Ooh, it just <laughs> freaks me out. It's unsettling. Uh-huh. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that empathy kills, mm-hmm. and so it made me think. And I apologize if I've recommended this for stumble upon before we really should make a list so we can keep track of what we recommend it no we shouldn't we should make the same recommendations episode <laughs> every after episode. week we recommend to stumble upon one movie yeah um, <laughs> we're really into this one movie this is blank. a great movie <laughs> we'll see if we national can... <laughs> treasure starring nicholas cage and john voight Ooh. an asshole <laughs> i love that movie so much it's great it's, it's, stupid. A, it's so bad i love it all right but the movie i'm actually gonna recommend is your next For a film that definitely shows that empathy kills, in this one, at least you get to kick some fucking ass. Yeah. 
So if you're looking for a slasher with a fucking badass lead, yeah, I would recommend your next. Who's it directed by, Austin? Adam Wingard, who did The Guest. <gasps> yes, The Guest, which we talked about in episode three of our podcast. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen. Definitely watch The Guest with Dan Stevens. He's amazing. Amazing. Especially if you're a big fan of Downton Abbey, this movie is just for you. And the if guest. You, and if you haven't seen the incredible meme of the British newscaster trying to ask uh, Dan Stevens what it felt like to win the part in The Guest uh, in the most awkward <laughs> phrased manner and Dan Stevens just giggling. It's such a good one. Uh, uh, you you should what really. What she say again? She she asks him how it felt to beat off a whole bunch of men <laughs> yes. to win the part. How many men did you beat off to get did, the part? Did it, did it feel great beating off all those men? <laughs> it was. Really, he's so cute. He's like dying of laughter. And she's like, "What? <laughs> oh, that was such a good moment. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, definitely." <laughs> Definitely watch The Guest if you haven't. Yeah. But do also watch Your Next, which is excellent. And what else should we recommend this week? You know, I don't know. Because the beginning of the movie starts with, of More of a Caller starts with suicide, I just have to recommend the writings of David Foster Wallace, who mm-hmm. is another person who experienced suicide, um, unfortunately, was in a lot of trauma in his life, uh, mental health issues. But his writing is incredible, especially his shorter works. Um, Infinite Jest is a bit of a beast yeah. and one I haven't been able to completely tackle myself. But his short works and his interview, the last interview uh, is what it's called. The last interview and it's David Foster Wallace's interview is just an incredible piece. It's called The Last Interview and Other Conversations. It's Melville Publishing. Mm-hmm. Melville House Publishing. Oh, right. When we were, we were getting that subscription in Melville. Yeah. So, yeah, I highly recommend... The writings of David Foster Wallace. Yeah. It's it, just, he's such an incredible, empathetic, big hole in his heart kind of writer. Yeah. He has a really good essay on uh, uh, Lost Highway by David Lynch, Ooh, which yeah. is, which is a really, which for me, like, I remember when uh, Lost Highway came out in cinemas and that was a really important film to me uh, for a long time. If you are feeling sad after watching this movie, I think the next thing I would recommend is watching Twin Peaks. Yeah. Because Agent Cooper makes everybody feel better just in the first season. Yeah. And last week was Twin Peaks Day. Oh, yes. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's all recommend everybody watch Twin Peaks. Yeah. Because Agent Cooper. Yeah. Some damn fine pie. It's a damn fine cup of coffee. I love it all. all right. <laughs> okay. On that note, thank you for spending time with us today. Yeah. Have a lovely have a lovely afternoon, day, evening, uh, morning, if you are a crazy fucking person who are watch- listening to us talk in the morning. Yeah. Why? Well, maybe because you're having a cup of coffee and you know this is the best way to have a conversation, which is movies and coffee. Yeah. Then maybe that's, maybe that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> but as always, you can find us at Fishtown Films on Instagram and Twitter, though we're more likely to respond to you if it's on Instagram than Twitter only because we're very bad at checking Twitter we will be posting in our stories the next movie that we're going to be discussing Mm -hmm. you will get some behind the scenes of our Mm post-production of Citywide that we're still working our way through hopefully the movie comes out sometime in April or May otherwise slide into our DMs give us some recommendations we hope to hear from you and if you're working on anything yourself feel free to share with us we love to catch up and see what everybody's up to yeah Art is a conversation. Always. So thank you for stopping by and we'll talk to you later. Cheers. Bye.